Robert Kirkman seems to have the Midas touch when it comes to creating hit comics, which eventually turn into huge hit TV series. So what's his secret? He has no college degree, no industry experience, no famous relatives, and comes off in interviews as kind of a regular guy. Is something else going on? Why did one of his closest collaborators eventually label him a proud liar and fraudster? Well, I spent the past few weeks reading hundreds of his comics, as well as listening to and reading just about every interview I could find with him and those close to him. And the very surprising story that emerged begins when Kirkman was just 22 years old, curled in a ball on his floor, shaking, crying, and holding himself. He had quit his job and spent all of his savings to make comics. And when his savings ran out, he opened credit cards to keep going. And now he was $40,000 in debt, making less than $500 a year, barely scraping together the minimum payments on the 17 credit cards he had opened. He had risked everything to make it in comics, and he had failed. Why would someone do that to themselves? Well, to answer that, we have to go back to one of the most important days in Kirkman's life, to the first day of seventh grade, social studies class in Cynthiana, Kentucky. Young Robert Kirkman is not paying attention. He's focused on drawing a picture of Spider-Man in his notebook. He sees the kid sitting next to him is drawing a picture of the X-Men. That other kid is Tony Moore. So of course, Kirkman and Moore hit it off because they have the shared dream of becoming comic book artists. Kirkman and Moore were coming of an age during an incredibly exciting time in the comic industry. See, the first comic Kirkman ever buys is Spider-Man Man number 344 with art by Eric Larson. And Larson is part of a new generation of young comic book artists who are transforming how comics look and are driving comic sales through the roof. Inspired by this brash new generation, Kirkman and Moore become obsessed with comics. Kirkman begs his parents to drive him into Lexington so he can go to an actual comic shop, and it's at this comic book store where Kirkman sees something that will alter the course of his life. It's a poster for Youngblood, a new comic by Rob Liefeld, the superstar artist of Marvel's X-Force and one of Kirkman's favorite creators. But his new comic isn't being published by Marvel. What's Youngblood? He asks the clerk at the comic shop. You haven't heard about Image Comics, he says, and so he fills him in. In case you haven't heard me tell this story before, here's the short version. The top Marvel artists, including Kirkman's favorite Eric Larson, had banded to together and defected from Marvel to start their own company. And they were going to invent brand new characters and control those characters themselves. And this, Kirkman decided, is what he wanted for himself. Not just to write and draw someone else's character, but to create something new and original. So the Image founders become Kirkman's heroes. And it wasn't just the comics from Image that inspired him, it was the business. And I think this is an interesting early clue to his success. Because Kirkman wasn't just obsessed with them as artists, but as entrepreneurs. Kirkman would go to sleep imagining himself at an Image Partners meeting, helping steer the course of their business. So, so inspired by Image, Kirkman and Moore would push each other to get better and better. Kirkman filled his notebook with designs for the characters that would one day star in the Image comics he would draw. But there was a big problem. While Moore was getting better and better as an artist, Kirkman wasn't. And after graduating, Moore got into art school. Kirkman didn't. Moore moved away while Kirkman got a job at the local comic shop. Kirkman was getting left behind. He illustrated one comic for a friend before realizing he wasn't cut out to make it as an artist. But Kirkman, as we'll see time and time again, isn't the kind of guy to accept defeat. He decides to work within his limitations. So he calls up Tony Moore and asks if they can work on a comic together. Kirkman will write and letter the comic, Moore will do the art, and they'll create something new and pitch it to Image Comics. Moore's on board, and they know you have to be loud and controversial to get noticed so their first project reflects that. It's called Battle Pope. They put together the pitch and mail it off to Image Comics. And sometime later, a letter arrives. A rejection letter. And again, this is where many people would probably stop, but not Robert Kirkman. He decides to self-publish Battle Pope. And I think it's here where the Kirkman we know today, the hybrid of writer and businessman, begins to emerge. Because while self-publishing maybe sounds easy, you couldn't just look this up online back then. But Kirkman is determined by asking around the comic story he works at, he's able to figure out how printing and distribution works. So he launches his own company and prints the first issue of Battle Pope and gets it distributed into comic shops. At 21 years old, Robert Kirkman and Tony Moore have their own comic book in stores. And just like the Image guys, they're doing it their own way and they're doing it as friends. But they don't stop there. They continue doing more issues of Battle Pope. And on top of that, Kirkman uses the company that he'd set up for Battle Pope to start publishing comics by other writers and artists. And he's not even making money. In fact, he's losing money. He's completely willing to destroy his entire life, his finances, to be able to work in the comic business. He quits his job so he can spend more time making comics. But now, as you know from earlier, it's catching up with him. He's racked up $40,000 in debt. He's struggling to make his minimum credit card payment. He's going to go into bankruptcy. It gets so bad that he even goes to an Amazon warehouse to apply for a job. I can just picture him sitting there, the application on a clipboard in his lap, ready to give up on his dream and re-enter the working world. But he doesn't. He walks out. 
and his luck starts to change. Around this time, a friend of his, who operates a small comic website, books an interview with Eric Larson. Kirkman asks if he can do the interview, and his friend says yes. Kirkman has a chance to talk to his idol. So he gets on the phone with Larson, and they actually hit it off. And they end up talking for two hours. Kirkman even asks Larson if he can put Savage Dragon in an issue of Battle Pope, and he agrees. And it doesn't stop there. As you can probably guess, because this is Robert Kirkman we're talking about, he's going to be persistent. He's got Eric Larson's phone number. And so he starts calling Larson every once in a while. And he's got a plan. Well, he's been working with more on Battle Pope. He's made friends with another incredibly talented artist named Corey Walker. And so they put together a new pitch for a comic that seems perfect for Image. And he sends that pitch off to Larson. Larson opens that package. And what does he see? Science talk. Despite their chummy relationship, Larson rejects the pitch. But Larson must have seen something he liked because he offers them the opportunity to do a miniseries with one of his Savage Dragon supporting characters, Super Patriot. Kirkman finally has the opportunity to publish a comic at Image. But Walker is hesitant. He really just wants to do Science Dog. So Kirkman lies. He tells Walker that Image wants to do Science Dog. They just want them to do Super Patriot first. So Walker agrees. And at 22 years old, Robert Kirkman fulfills his childhood dream of writing a comic for Image. But Kirkman isn't satisfied. He doesn't want to be writing other people's characters. He wants to write his own. So he starts sending a barrage of pitches to Image Comics. He gets rejected again and again, but he doesn't stop. And eventually, Image starts saying yes. They publish a bunch of his comics. But there's a problem. None of them are selling very well, and most end up canceled after only a few issues. But it's around this time that he and Cory Walker launch a little superhero book called... It's basically their version of Savage Dragon, a combination of all the things they love about superhero comics, especially Image Comics. And while it's really great, it's not flying off the shelves. It's hard to stand out in the mountain of superhero comics that were being published at this time, which must have been frustrating for Kirkman because he's got a big twist plan for issue 25. But at the rate they're going, they're never gonna make it to issue 25. Enter Jim Valentino. Now, I feel bad for Valentino. He's kind of the image founder that no one really talks about, but every time he comes up, he's like this wise man on the mountain because he tells Kirkman, don't wait until issue 25. Do your twist next issue. And so he does. And that absolutely changes the trajectory of the book. Now, not only is it a fantastic superhero comic, but it's doing something in the genre that DC and Marvel would never dare to do. And no, I'm not going to spoil it. You should just go read it. I'll put links below. But there's still another problem. See, Kirkman is adamant that for a comic to be successful, it has to ship regularly every single month. He knew how devastating it was for the early image comics that kept missing their deadlines, but Walker can't keep up with penciling a full issue every month. So they agree to bring in a fill-in artist for issue eight to give Walker some time to catch up. After scouring the internet, they find Ryan Ott a 25-year-old warehouse worker who has never illustrated a professional comic in his life, but posts really cool stuff online. They decide to take a chance on him. And Otley delivers a fully penciled and inked issue in two weeks. This is the guy for Kirkman. He and Walker agree that Otley will become the full-time artist on Invincible. Now, it's important to remember that in this era, bookstores and increasingly Amazon were becoming important parts of the comic book market. As a result, it had become popular for writers to write for the trade, meaning padding out stories into six or so issues so they'd fit well into the collected trade paperback editions that would go off to the bookstores. And while this sometimes worked, often it meant that single issues would have little or no story momentum, and readers who read monthly comics at the comic shop were frequently disappointed. But Kirkman bucked that trend with Invincible. It reminds me most of 80s Marvel comics, where each issue had a satisfying beginning, middle, and end, but also served as part of a huge, never-ending soap opera. Kirkman uses single pages as story units, dropping in one page here and there for subplot that will build over months and sometimes years before finally paying off in a full issue of their own. But he combined that classic storytelling structure with the writing for the trade strategy and making sure his biggest beats and cliffhangers would fall about every six issues. So whether you're reading single issues or trade paperbacks or even larger hard covers and compendiums, you would always feel like you were reading the story the way it was meant to be read. And unlike DC and Marvel superhero books, it's easy to follow. Just pick a format, start with number one, and keep going. And he was able to overcome one of the biggest problems with those Marvel comics, which was a limited ability for characters to grow. Superhero comics can often feel like old school sitcoms, where the status quo always has to be maintained and characters can't really change. But because Invincible is Kirkman's own creation, he didn't have to follow those rules. It never resets back to a status quo, but is constantly evolving. And it's also got just some great storytelling. Like, check out the fresh way that they illustrate Invincible getting his powers, his dad coming home for dinner, or Invincible trying to keep up with his dad. They're mixing classic cartooning with 
with modern sensibilities, and even today it still feels fresh, fun, and exciting. So it probably comes as no surprise that Invincible starts to build momentum and grow its readership. Kirkman even gets noticed by Marvel and gets hired to write comics for them as well. Things are going well enough that he's starting to pay down his debt. And if this story ended there, Kirkman would likely be another successful comic book writer. But it's Kirkman, so it doesn't end there. He still hasn't found his project to do with Tony Moore, his seventh grade friend, the guy who helped him get his start in comics. And so they started working together on a comic about zombies. Now, growing up, Kirkman wasn't actually allowed to watch horror movies. So after he moved out of his parents' house, Moore would give him an education in horror movies, especially zombie movies. And I just wanna pause because I think it's easy to forget that there was a time when we were starved for zombie content. This was the early 2000s, before the Dawn of the Dead remake, before Shaun of the Dead, before zombies were everywhere and on everything. Because after the Romero originals, there were a lot of great 80s zombie movies. By the 90s, things had pretty much dried up outside of video games. Zombies had become kind of a forgotten element of the horror canon. It seemed like everything that could be done with zombies had been done. But after one of those late nights watching zombie movies with more, Kirkman had an idea. He realized that the ending of zombie movies always kind of suck. So what about a zombie movie that never ends? What happens after the movie? How does society rebuild in a world filled with zombies? That's what's really interesting. So they put together a comic and bring it to Image. And the name of that comic? Night of the Living Dead, the comic series. See, Night of the Living Dead was public domain, so anyone could use the name, and Kirkman and Moore figured they could use the established name to help tap into more sales. But again, Jim Valentino descends from his mountain with words of wisdom. Why not just name it something new, he says. That way you can own the rights to it. And so they tweak their pitch and bring it back as The Walking Dead. The image folks are interested, but they feel like it's still missing something. So Kirkman tells him, don't worry, he's got a big twist plan, just like he did with Invincible. He's gonna reveal that the zombies are all just a part of a plot by aliens to weaken the infrastructure of Earth so that they can invade. With that, the image guys are sold. They'll publish it. It wouldn't be till it actually came out that they realized that Kirkman had lied to them about the aliens. And again, it's easy to forget that this was a small comic and a big risk for Image. Horror comics were not big sellers. So they published in black and white, which I'm sure was a creative decision, but also helped keep costs down. And they printed less than 10,000 copies. Also, the plot of The Walking Dead, outside of all the zombie action, is about a growing rift forming between two childhood friends. And sadly, that was a mirror for what was happening between Kirkman and more. But before we get into that and everything that comes after, let's take a look at the comic itself. Because while I've heard people say that Kirkman just got lucky, The Walking Dead did not succeed by accident. It builds on everything Kirkman had been doing in Invincible. Instead of focusing purely on action, it turns the zombie apocalypse into an epic human drama with rock solid single issues layering on new characters and plot lines that build into page turning trade paperbacks and eventually compendiums. The whole thing has an immense focus on readability. Comics at this time had been dialing back the number of panels on a page to allow the art to shine, but that was coming at the expense of storytelling. The Walking Dead bucks that trend, returning to the nine panel grid popularized by Watchmen, which makes it easy to follow even for readers who don't have a lot of experience reading comic books. There's no narration, captions, fancy layouts, or cross cutting. It plays out like a movie, just a succession of images accompanied by dialogue and sound effects. Now, Kirkman's style is very dialogue heavy, but he'd been lettering all of these comics himself, and that seems to have given him a very good sense of how to write and lay out dialogue that is dense, but always easy to follow. We almost never see characters talk from off panel. We get to look at the speaker, and Kirkman has always worked with artists like Moore who can convey the emotion in close-ups, and it really brings the dialogue to life. And even though so much of it feels classic, it owes a huge debt to the image books that Kirkman and Moore grew up on. Kirkman loves the big full-page splash reveal that he was introduced to by image artist Rob Liefeld, and Moore's art combines a kind of classical cartooning with the hyper-detailed 90s style of the image guys. They had taken everything that made that first generation of image comics stand out while reintroducing the solid comic book fundamentals that they had lacked. It all adds up to a compulsively readable, downright addicting book. And people are getting hooked. While sales started slow, through word of mouth, each issue was steadily selling more and more. This little black and white horror comic was becoming a huge hit. But behind the scenes, things were going off the rails. Apparently, Moore is not able to keep up with the monthly schedule that Kirkman demanded. Kirkman claims that it took Moore almost a full year to draw the first six issues of The Walking Dead. Moore, it seems, didn't agree with Kirkman's philosophy that a book needs to be monthly. He wanted to take his time and create the best comic he could. 
This created a huge rift between them. Moore would describe Kirkman's view on the artistic process as fundamentally dissonant to his own. And so, Kirkman is forced to choose between his relentless drive for success and his lifelong best friend. And so, after six issues, Tony Moore was removed from The Walking Dead and replaced by the famously dependable Charlie Adlard. Moore signs his rights to The Walking Dead over to Robert Kirkman and moves on. And Kirkman and Adlard become an unstoppable force, keeping that steady drumbeat of monthly issues and continuing sales growth. Now, I'm going to use one of Kirkman's cutaway techniques, because around this time, this man walks into his local comic shop and buys an issue of The Walking Dead. But we'll get back to him. So Kirkman has made it. He's got two hit books at Image. He's doing work for Marvel. He's a popular comic writer, just as he dreamed. But this is Robert Kirkman. He wants more. You see, since joining Image, he had become kind of their golden boy. He'd become friendly with all of the partners, except one. The one who he hadn't even met in person. The man whose pure boiling hatred of Marvel had helped start Image, who put Image on the map with his comic Spawn, before upending the toy industry, Todd McFarlane. And if you guys want a Todd McFarlane episode, just let me know and I will read 300 issues of Spawn for you. Through intermediaries, McFarlane had offered Kirkman the job of writing Spawn. Kirkman being Kirkman, he turned it down but asked if they could create something new together. And so, at Comic-Con in 2006, Kirkman is finally invited up to McFarlane's hotel suite for a face-to-face -face meeting. Kirkman's nervous going into his hotel room and when he finally gets there, he learns that Todd McFarlane doesn't wear shoes. So Kirkman is trying to listen to McFarlane, who always talks a mile a minute, but all he can focus on is how dirty McFarlane's feet are that he's got kicked up on the bed. But whatever happened that meeting, McFarlane is impressed and they decide to launch a new book together. And while that comic, Haunt, doesn't exactly make waves, it leads to something even more important. Because when Haunt comes out, Kirkman has another chance to get FaceTime with McFarlane when they're doing a signing at Comic-Con. In between signing and talking to fans, McFarlane asks Kirkman a question. Would you quit working for Marvel? Why, Kirkman wants to know so you can become a partner at Image Comics. In the nearly 20 years Image had existed, they had never added a new partner, but they decided that Kirkman was the right guy to continue their mission of creator independence. Just as he had dreamed as a kid, Robert Kirkman would be going to Image Partners meetings and helping decide the future of the company. After joining, Kirkman puts out a manifesto calling for other creators to quit Marvel and DC and come work for Image. And this manifesto, I think, sums up his attitude. Why did I leave Marvel Comics to do creator own work? I did it to save the entire comic book industry. He emphasizes the importance of creative independence and just how important it is for creators to own their own creations. And he takes a lot of heat for this. A number of Marvel and DC writers lash out at him, claiming that he just got lucky having a hit creator-owned book, that they depend on the steady paycheck from those big companies, and that they can't afford to take the same risks that he did. But whatever the reaction, Image had been transformed in Kirkman's wake. Both as a writer and as a partner, he paves the way for a lot of fantastic, long-form, individualistic books to come out at Image. So now, Kirkman is Image writer writer, image partner, industry leader, but this is Kirkman. He's not done yet because he's always wanted to work in TV and hasn't had that opportunity yet. And honestly, there's always been a bit of a disconnect between TV and comics, especially at that time where TV writers considered comic writers second class. And besides Brian K. Vaughn, comic writers hadn't really had a lot of success in TV. But now Kirkman had a shot because Hollywood wants to adapt The Walking Dead. He takes a lot of meetings with Hollywood executives, but they all want to change Walking Dead into something different from his vision. And again, somebody who just wanted money would probably have agreed to one of those pitches, but Kirkman is adamant about his vision, so he continues to pass on them and just focus on his comics. But remember this guy, the Walking Dead fan from 2005? That's Frank Darabont, a hardcore zombie fan and a B-movie horror writer who wrote the best Nightmare on Elm Street sequel and the criminally underrated Blob remake. Oh, he also directed The Shawshank Redemption, one of the most beloved movies of all time. And he wants to make Walking Dead into a TV show. He approaches Kirkman and immediately speaks his language. He sees that the zombies are just a backdrop to tell human stories. For years, they work together to develop the script, but it's not until they get Gail Ann Hurd on board, they're able to convince the upstart cable network, AMC, to take a chance and produce a pilot. Now, this is a network at the time known for classy stuff like Mad Men and Breaking Bad. So it's a pretty big risk for them to do a pulpy zombie show. And unlike most creators, Kirkman uses his leverage to negotiate himself a position in the writer's room so he can see firsthand how his vision is being translated to screen. And they stay pretty true to his source material. Kirkman begins feeling hopeful that their pilot may even match Mad Men's numbers. But when the show premieres a few months later, it doesn't match Mad Men's numbers. It triples them. It had successfully translated what worked so well about the comic, a compelling, addicting human drama set against the backdrop of the zombie apocalypse. 
but there are problems with his collaborators here too. What has been described as a personal rift had formed between Kirkman and Darabont. The rumors say that Darabont wanted to depart from Kirkman's vision for The Walking Dead. There were also conflicts between Darabont and AMC over the budget for the show, and it all became very messy very quickly. But at the end of the day, yet again, Kirkman's vision won out and his collaborator was replaced. But just like it had in the comic, Kirkman's vision for The Walking Dead was a success. It would pull off that same feat, steadily growing its audience and eventually becoming the highest rated basic cable show of all time. So after the premiere of Walking Dead, Kirkman is on his victory lap doing podcasts, gets asked a question about how to get an artist to work for you and answers it this way. As an aspiring writer and comic book writer, how do I go about getting an illustrator? Uh, trickery and deceit. <laughs> Unfortunately, that probably hit a little too close to home for some people because a few weeks after the premiere of The Walking Dead, Tony Moore sues Robert Kirkman. He claimed that Kirkman had effectively deceived him when he sold him his portion of The Walking Dead and referenced that podcast clip saying, Kirkman is a proud liar and fraudster who freely admits that he has no qualm about misrepresenting material facts in order to consummate business transactions. And it is precisely that illicit conduct which has led to the present lawsuit and to Kirkman's business success generally. He wanted to be relisted as a co-creator of The Walking Dead. Kirkman responded, The lawsuit is ridiculous. We each had legal representation seven years ago, and now he is violating the same contract he initiated and approved, and he wants to misrepresent the fees he was paid and continues to be paid for the work he was hired to do. Look, Kirkman's story is in so many ways an inspiration. Here's a guy who is so committed to both his artistic and business vision that he risked everything he had and succeeded, becoming, in an incredibly short period of time, a completely unstoppable force in both comics and television. But his story is also a testament to the high personal costs of that very drive. Because while he and Moore settled their lawsuit out of court, that friendship, the one that had inspired both of them to get into comics, that had launched their careers with Battle Pope, that had taken them to new heights with The Walking Dead, was destroyed forever. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking, subscribing, sharing on social media, and commenting down below. I'll see you soon.